Abraham Zapruder was an amateur photographer who just happened to be taking home movies on November 22nd, 1963. What put the only person who photographed the assassination of John F. Kennedy at that exact place at that exact moment in time? Join us for the story behind the story. We all remember the famous news events, front page stories that grip the nation's attention and are firmly etched in our memories. But behind the headlines, there are hidden stories with surprising, intriguing twists that have until now remained untold. We'll bring you stories of people, places, and events we've all heard about, but we've never heard the story behind the story. November 22nd, 1963, Dallas, Texas. Just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. Boston Hospital, there has been a shooting. Boston Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. I repeat, a shooting... Just a moment, we have a bulletin coming in. We now switch you directly to Boston Hospital. The President of the United States is dead. President Kennedy has been dated. It's official now. The President is dead. That day is one we will never forget. And that agonizing moment was firmly etched into our minds by one lone cameraman. Not a TV reporter, not a magazine photographer, just an ordinary man with a home movie camera. Abraham Zapruder woke up that morning totally unaware that within five hours he would be inescapably bound to this tragic event forever and that the film he took that day would be a crucial part of American history. Zapruder was 58 years old, father of two children, and like thousands of Americans, had purchased his home movie camera to chronicle his growing family. He was really into his family a lot. He talked about them all the time. The grandkids came down. He had pictures of the grandkids in the office. And he was just, he was a family person. On the day of the assassination, Zapruder arrived at work at 8 a.m. He owned a dress manufacturing firm called Jennifer's of Dallas, operating out of fourth floor offices at Ely Plaza, across the street from the Texas School Book Depository. Did you bring your camera? No. When he arrived at work, he had not brought his home movie camera, but his secretary convinced him to go home to get it. Maybe you're right. He was so. a tremendous Kennedy fan. Talked about him all the time. Admired his politics. Uh, there just wasn't too much about him that he didn't really think was great. At 11 a.m., Zapruder left his building, went home to pick up his camera, and then returned to Dealey Plaza, looking for a good vantage point to film the president. At 11.37, John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie arrived on Air Force One at Love Field near Dallas. The motorcade took the president on a parade route through downtown Dallas, where thousands of cheering Texans greeted him. The parade route ended at Dealey Plaza. From there, the motorcade would travel to a luncheon at the Dallas Trademark. Zapruder's office was here on the northeast corner of Dealey Plaza. The motorcade was scheduled to drive up Elm Street and onto the Stemmons Freeway. Zapruder initially decided to film from the middle of Dealey Plaza, across from his office. At 12.20 p.m., the motorcade continued through downtown Dallas along Main Street. The crowds were thick on the sidewalk. At 12.22 p.m., Zapruder checked his camera, taking a brief shot of his secretary, Marilyn Sitzman. At 12.24, the motorcade approached Dealey Plaza. At that moment, Zapruder decided he would have a better view from a nearby wall. Zapruder had a problem with heights, and even this low wall was disconcerting for him. Mr. Z had a tendency to get dizzy when he got on high places. He asked me if I would get up behind him and hold on to him, which is what I did. We stood there and talked for a while until we saw the cars coming around. Then he got the camera ready and was ready to start filming us just as they made the corner. And as they made the turn, you know, everybody down there started clapping and, you know, carrying on. And of course, he's filming and I'm holding on to him. And 
it seemed like they had just barely turned down the street and I heard what I thought was firecrackers. And as they came down, the last shot came right in front of us. We could see the impact that the bullet had on Kennedy's head. And it was just like, I didn't move because I, I was like unbelieving of the whole thing. And I don't know what Mr. Z's feelings was because he didn't move either. He just kept filming. I don't remember getting down. I don't remember me getting down off of the concrete abutment or Mr. Z. I don't know where Mr. Z went. He wandered off. I don't know where. I do not remember. I mean, it's kind of vague. From what I was told, when Mr. Z got back upstairs, he was he was in pretty bad shape. He's been shot. I have it here on film. Call the FBI. I don't know what prompted him or somebody, but they put the camera in the safe. We had a small safe there. At 1 p.m., Zapruder sat stunned in his office. President Kennedy was taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital. The chief of the Secret Service and a Dallas Morning News reporter came up, and the chief of the Secret Service asked for the film, and Mr. Z agreed. Thank you, Mr. Zapruder. Do you know where we can get this developed right now? No, I don't. You can take it to WFAA. It's right down the street. Yeah, Secret is. Service agents escorted Zapruder to a local television station. While there, Zapruder was persuaded to be interviewed and describe what he had filmed. Then I heard another shot or two. I couldn't say what it was one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything. And I kept on shooting. That's about all. I'm just sick again. I think that pretty well expresses the entire yeah. feelings of it. At the request of the Secret Service, Kodak developed the film immediately. From the original film, three prints were made. Zapruder gave two copies to the Secret Service and kept the original film and the one remaining copy. For the next hour, he drove aimlessly around Dallas. Across town, the press was scrambling for any information on assassination. From the Dallas police station, a Life magazine correspondent, Patsy Swank, called her bureau chief with information about Zapruder. Who is this guy? She said, nobody seems to know, but it's, it's Z. It starts with a Z. It's Zabuti, Zabruder, something like that. So I was writing this down phonetically. And I said, Patsy, let me know what else you hear. She's whispering all this time, so no, no one else would hear the information she had, which we at that point thought was not in the possession of, of other reporters. Um, and we were right. Stoley tracked Zapruder down through the Dallas phone book and called him every 15 minutes. Finally, about 11 p.m., this weary voice answered the phone. And I said that uh, Life magazine would be interested in talking about the rights, the f print rights to that film, but I really would like to come out right then and see it. I realized that once the cops knew about this, they would start telling every reporter they knew and, um, and the feeding frenzy would begin soon enough. Good night. Exhausted, Zapruder refused to show the film that night, but did agree to meet Stoley the next morning. At 8 a.m. at his dress manufacturing company, Zapruder showed the film to local Dallas Secret Service agents. Now this is very quick. It happens very fast. Richard Stoley was also there. There was no sound, of course except this rickety old projector kind of grinding away. So there you are with the motorcade coming around Dealey Plaza, disappearing behind that big freeway sign. There's this kind of tension because you sort of, you don't know what he's got, but you know something awful is about to happen and suddenly uh, there is that headshot. Secret Service agents, these are the men uh, whose job is to protect the president, and there they were, for the first time in history, Secret Service agents watching film evidence of the catastrophic failure uh, to do their job, to protect the man that they were uh, employed to protect. It was the single most dramatic thing I've ever seen in my career as a journalist. 
people in New York after I'd seen the film, and I said, "This we got to have this," and they said, "Okay, you're authorized to go up to fifty thousand uh, dollars. If it goes beyond that, get back to us." It was an unpleasant experience for uh, Mr. Sapruder. I mean, this is a very sharp businessman, and I'm sure if we'd been talking about sewing machine needles or fabric or something like that, he would have had my scalp. Life magazine is the place for these pictures. It was a very kind of elaborate yeah, conversation, which really somehow avoided the sort of direct sense of we're, we're bargaining over film of a murder. The negotiations concluded, Stoley drew up a simple five-line contract, giving Life magazine the exclusive rights to publish still photographs from the film for $50,000. Moments later, Zapruder faced hostile reporters, angered that they had been denied the right to even bid on the film. This is a man who had lived in, in relative tranquility all his life. He certainly hadn't had to face anything like this, and um, he was quite shaken by it. Reporters continued to hound Zapruder for the television rights. He settled the matter two days later by selling all broadcast rights to Life magazine for an additional $100,000. I think uh, the wrong person could have made millions in the worst possible way. He could have sold bits of the film to various publications. He would have exploited it overseas. He could have made an entire movie. The public was mourning Jack Kennedy. They would have paid literally millions of dollars to have seen something like that. Fearing criticism, Zapruder donated $25,000 to the widow of the Dallas policeman slain when Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested. Nightmares haunted Zapruder for the rest of his life. The terrible images from Dealey Plaza would not leave his mind. For months after the assassination, investigators plagued Zapruder with endless but vital questions about what he had seen and heard. In 1964, he testified before the Warren Commission. As he recalled the traumatic events of Kennedy's death, he broke down in tears. He wasn't a hero, he wasn't a villain, he wasn't a victim, he was the most ordinary man in the world, caught up in something so extraordinary that it still astonishes me, and astonished him to the moment of his death. Abraham Zapruder died seven years after the assassination. In his remaining years, he found it very difficult to use a motion picture camera again and lost interest in home movies. The Bell and Howell camera he used in 1963 was donated to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. The Zapruder film is also vaulted in the National Archives. In 1975, Life magazine sold all rights to the film back to the Zapruder family for one dollar. Thank you for joining us tonight. Be with us next time for another edition of the story behind the stories.